can you guys see the screen? Uh, yes. yes, we can see your full screen. Yeah, yeah your screen is good. Uh, uh, so yeah, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, and um, introducing the field and also uh, a little bit on prospects of quantum computing for CFD. Um, I, I'm Suhas. I'm, uh, I'm a PhD student uh, at, at Stanford University uh, in my four, fifth year right now. Um, okay, let's jump right into this. So, uh, so CFD is used in, in a lot of applications. Um, for example, we have this uh, uh, space uh, uh, CFD of a, a, sh a shuttle, a space shuttle uh, launch vehicle. We can see um, that it's ve it's very important to do the CFD uh, because we need to know the thermal loading on the vehicle and also th uh, uh, mechanical loading. Um, so we can see the temperature plots on this. Um, so it's sort of important to do this. Uh, um, beforehand because it's like you got only one chance to to launch this vehicle and so so the second figure that you see here is like a CFD model of uh, of uh, of the heart um, you can simulate the flow of uh, blood in these uh, arteries uh, so it's important uh, to for example if you have an ailment you can sort of construct um, uh, uh, construct a CFD of uh, a CFD model of a heart and then do simulations. And for this to sort of uh, for you to achieve this, you you still need uh, some time um, before which you can sort of do this in real time. Um, so CFD is also used in weather modeling. Uh, here I'm just showing a, a, a plot of a weather fo forecast uh, and the monsoon uh, over India um, by IBM. Um, weather forecast is probably one of the biggest applications of CFD uh, that's currently like sort of. Uh, um, it's that's one of the applications where CFD is currently used uh, uh, in the most extent. And here, I mean, CFD is also used in sports. Uh, it's important to optimize uh, um, the. It's important to know like the lift and drag of these. Um, um, like for example, in this case, the soccer, uh, soccer, football. Um, they also do this for uh, golf. And for example, if you uh, know that the the shape of the golf ball, there are some dimples on that. That's uh, that is done to sort of uh, create turbulence early on and reduce the drag um, so that it can uh, fly in the air for longer time. Um, so it's also used in uh, aerodynamics of a race car for um, like you have a, a Formula One car, you, they optimize this uh, wing and the, uh, to increase the downforce in this case, not to reduce the drag as such, but um, to increase the downforce so that the, the car doesn't really slip uh, while you're cornering. Uh, it's also used in, um, CFD is also used in, say, say for example, uh, um, uh, atomization applications like uh, this is, uh, the last figure here is um, is a spray atomization, uh, spray in an internal combustion engine for gas turbine engines. Uh, so it's uh, it's important to optimize the actual spray character uh, spray uh, that you obtain. Uh, for example, this is a fuel uh, injected into atmosphere. Uh, in this case, in, into an into a chamber that is in atmospheric conditions. Um, it, uh, you need to know the exact properties of these droplets, fine droplets that are formed, um, because these determine, uh, for example, the emission behavior like CO2 and NOx emission behavior of the engine. Um, so yeah, if you look at all these, like CFD is being like used in a growing number of uh, disciplines these days, and for all this, we need like more and more computational power, and it and the demand is increasing day by day, and and if you and the large scale simulations, uh, you can only do those on like uh, supercomputer, uh, like large scale uh, high performance supercomputer, and it's slow and expensive. Uh, so yeah, so one alternate uh, option that that I can think of right now is quantum computing um, for the future. Um, so a little bit of background about myself um, before jumping into the actual talk. So I, I did my uh, undergrad uh, at National Institute of Technology, uh, Karnataka, um, in India, um, in and I um, my major was in mechanical engineering. So that's where I was sort of. Uh, I got to know about CFD uh, in my third and final year. Um, 
uh, uh, the thesis project. And after my undergrad, I wasn't um, completely sure about doing graduate studies. So I went and I started working in um, in a research institute called HCDR. Um, and I worked there on multi-phase flow and two-phase flows um, and modeling, subgrid modeling for that. And then I started, uh, and then after that, for one year, I worked uh, as a project assistant at Indian Institute of Science. And yeah, and then I was like, um, this, uh, and then uh, after that, I was pretty much sure that uh, that I wanted to pursue a gra uh, pursue graduate studies um, in CFD and also particularly uh, in multi-phase flows and um, multi-phase flow modeling. So, um, and then I uh, applied and uh, started my uh, graduate study uh, graduate studies at Stanford, and I work with uh, Parviz Moyen and Ali Mani. They're my um, um, advisors here. So yeah, I would like to acknowledge like for of all the people that I sort of worked with over the years and um, met and sort of like have learned a lot uh, from them uh, from all these places. So it's just um, so I acknowledge them for that. So yeah, in this talk, uh, I'll be initially talking. Uh, I'll be initially presenting uh, fundamentals of CFD and then talk a little bit on like the current state of the art in CFD and then research active research areas. Uh, and then, um, like, uh, yeah, and talk uh, a bit about increasing why we need uh, large scale computing resources. And then this sort of acts as a segue towards motivating uh, quantum computing or the need for quantum computing in CFT at the end. Um, so, yeah, let's look at this plot. Um, uh, it's, it's a timeline, so I just made this up. Uh, so it's, it's like there is no exact scale on, uh, there's no exact uh, metric or like uh, on the Y scale, it's just a perceived interest of CFD over time. Um, so, for example, in 19, um, uh, so the idea of uh, using numerical methods to solve these fluid flow problems uh, was just was first formulated by Richardson, uh, Levis Fry Richardson in 1910s. He he sort of came up with the idea of you can use ten like hundreds of people. Uh, and then they can sort of do these uh, calculation um, and then pass on the information to the neighbor. And then, uh, yeah, so basically he came up with this sort of, he called it like forecast factory and he used it for weather forecast. And of course, he uh, his idea miserably failed when they tried it in 1910s with uh, like hundreds of people. Um, but it became sort of, uh, when, but they could actually... Um, uh, show that it works when when the first computers came, like in 1940s, the ENIAC was like the first programmable computer. Uh, so they actually implemented his idea and they showed that it can be successful. And um, yeah, so so basically what they did was they tried uh, for uh, tried to predict the weather for uh, weather for next 24 hours, but their calculation took for almost took almost 24 hours. So it was like it was a great uh, demonstration, but Sure, I mean, uh, people were uh, excited about it, and but then, of course, they forgot about it after that because it's like, if you need 24 hours to predict what's happening for 24, next 24 hours, it's, it's kind of useless at that point. Um, so, but later on, like, uh, as computers uh, evolved and became uh, um, like faster and uh, uh, more, uh, less expensive, uh, people started working on like um, numerical methods and developing different, uh, Models, for example, like the finite uh, most popular methods, finite difference method, and finite volume method. I'll be talking about all these later on in the talk, but uh, just to give uh, the timeline here. Um, and Rand's modeling, uh, turbulence model, Rand's turbulence modeling came in around 1970s, and first uh, direct numerical simulation of a small, uh, for example, small turbulent channel flow was done in 1980s uh, here at Stanford. Um, and I think RANS, a lot of this RANS development happened at Imperial um, and early CFD development uh, at Imperial in, in United uh, Kingdom. And, and in late 1990s, uh, every uh, like, uh, non-aerospace uh, people started using this, like for example, in uh, General Motors, Ford, like all um, um, automobile industries. And after uh, 2000s, I think it's, uh, it's sort of the field uh, explored and sort of uh, it's being used in every uh, area now. Um, yeah, just to give a little uh, basic uh, basic um, 
uh, equations, uh, what we call as Navier-Stokes equation in for fluid flow, uh, for those people that are sort of not from um, mechanical engineering or a CFD background. So this equation is sort of uh, the equation that governs all the fluid flow in the continuum limit. Um, so the first equation is like we call it continuity. Uh, it's just a mass uh, conservation of mass. So you have some mass, it cannot be destroyed or uh, generated. This is it's just a statement of that. The second one is the momentum balance of the Navier-Stokes, uh, which is also just a reformulation of uh, uh, Newton's second law, basically, because uh, everything that uh, you have on the right hand side is just a uh, force. And on the left hand side is like mass times acceleration. Um, so yeah, so the row that you see, the row symbol is just the density and the capital bold U is the velocity field. Here you're applying Newton's second law for a parcel of fluid um, instead of a solid body or like any other. Um, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So one important thing that I have to say here is like the. So you can see that there are only two uh, equations, or like at least two uh, in this. Uh, you have three sort of uh, components of the velocity u, uh, and the system is unclosed, and you need to solve a Poisson equation, uh, additional equation to get this pressure field. Uh, so this is sort of the most expensive part. Um, uh, of the computation, um, just wanted to point that out. And one more complexity is like this equation, as you can see, it's a nonlinear coupled PDE. So, so this term is like the the challenging, most challenging term to compute. Not the most expensive, but most challenging term. Um, yeah, um, yeah, and there are like no analytical solutions, and like uh, for the most general equation, and and the existence and smoothness cannot be proved. So it's one of the seven. Millennium uh, price problems. So typically, what we do is uh, uh, adopt numerical or like um, use employ numerical uh, approaches. Uh, so some of the popular CFD approaches are like um, are here. Like I just want to give a brief uh, um, uh, idea or like what just to um, uh, just to make uh, everyone familiar with what are the what are the what all options we have here uh, on the table. So the the most popular approach uh, I would say is the finite volume in CFD for fluid applications. So here um, you sort of integrate the equation and, and look for solutions in in the weak form. Um, and finite difference uh, is uh, you divide the domain into like sort of more regular size, uh, more regular looking grid like the one that you have here uh, um, in the figure and. Uh, instead of uh, integrating the system, you uh, approximate the derivatives uh, using the finite differences and look for strong form of the solution. And that, and another method, uh, it's mostly used for turbulence and other things, uh, uh, turbulence and other um, related simulations is spectral method. Here, uh, you convert the physical space, um, you convert the system from physical space into wave space or like spectral space by using say fast Fourier transform or um, any other, uh, um, you can use uh, other option. Uh, there are other options like chip shift transform and you solve the system in wave number space. Um, and then once you're done solving, you can uh, inverse transform it and uh, come back to the physical space. Um, so there are, so these are like some of the mesh based, mesh based methods and there are particle based methods to like, for, uh, one of the pop most popular ones is like smooth particle hydrodynamics. You have these uh, here. You don't have any grid, but you have some particles moving and they're tracked um, using basic um, uh, Newton's laws. And you can sort of uh, use some weighting function to extract the density and velocity, and all the macroscopic quantities. Um, so yeah, these particle based methods are like sort of more common in graphics community. Uh, because they're fast but less accurate compared to other these mesh based methods and and one advantage is like they also satisfy Galilean invariance. So people use these particle based methods, uh, for example, for astrophysical applications where you have like very high speeds of gas uh, uh, moving around um, in. Yeah, so in that context, finite and these mesh based methods are not uh, accurate enough. Um, so yeah, I just want uh, so here uh, I am going to go a little bit uh, in depth about finite volume. Um, 
and I'll be only talking about finite volume in this talk because that's sort of the most relevant and most used method for uh, fluid applications. Um, so the first step is to divide the domain um, into uh, control volumes. You can use arbitrary shape control volume, but here it's the most popular one is the triangle shape uh, or um, hexagonal shape that you have here, like the gray um, area. And you store the um, you store the quantities of interest at these locations, and and the next step is to sort of integrate the system. So if this is your coupled generic coupled system of equation uh, with a quantity of interest u and some divergence of some flux quantity, you integrate the system um, within each of these control volume. So and you 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 are sort of storing these the quantities here at this point and. If you consider this as a control volume, you integrate this here. And using Gauss divergence theorem, you can convert this volume integral into surface integral. And you can sort of take this integral inside this time derivative and average it, average, uh, find an average for the velocity inside this control volume. So now you have like a system of approximate ODEs, um, which you can sort of solve using standard ODE solution techniques like. Rangekara or um, Euler time stepping uh, methods. Um, and the final step is, of course, to visualize the results. And yeah, that's one of an, another uh, field uh, itself um, as a whole. And also to refine the grid and to decrease the um, cell size uh, to establish convergence, which is very important. Um, so some of the grid, uh, so, uh, so these are some of the like the the grids that you can see uh, um, that people use in CFD. For example, like the most simplest one is like a Cartesian uh, grid. Uh, it's structured, and and the and the one that you see here on the second one is the unstructured mesh. Uh, the the way they I mean that it's differentiated is based on like how you store the database. It's not really how the mesh looks. I think that's sort of a misconception. A little bit in the community, but um, yeah. So the unstructured mesh is uh, used for more complex-looking bodies. Like for example, you have uh, a shuttlecock here on the right, and also uh, an airfoil. Airfoil is like a cross section of a wing of an uh, aircraft, and you can uh, see that if you use Cartesian grid here uh, uh, to approximate this boundary, you need to use very fine grid points. So this is sort of an adaptive mesh. The mesh size changes in domain, and and it's a good thing uh, because you want to capture these things that are happening in the in this wake region. Uh, but uh, it's uh, one disadvantage is that it's it's still not a good approximation of the surface. So uh, it's big, and walls are uh, very important. Like for example, the surface of the uh, uh, the material here, the shuttlecock, is the most important region. In the domain, so we are going to talk about that later on a little bit. Um, that's one of the reasons why you don't use Cartesian uh, mesh. Instead, you choose to you can use unstructured mesh where you can sort of fit the grid onto the body and it can be arbitrarily shaped. Uh, and yeah, which results in very high accuracy. Um, so yeah, this is uh, just uh, uh, a primer on like how why visualization is important. Um, and this is a simulation of NASA's uh, Mars lander. Um, so let me go ahead and play this and you guys can see. Let me know if you can actually. Can you hear it? NASA is working to send humans to Mars. Six yeah, we can hear. Travel for 10 months okay. and when they near the planet, they will transfer to a lander, which is 16 meters in diameter and approximately the size of a two story house. Because of the size of the lander and the thin atmosphere, they cannot use parachutes to slow their descent. They must use what is called retropropulsion to rapidly decelerate from 12,000 miles per hour to zero in less than seven minutes. Simulating this is key to the success of the mission. To do that, NASA has been using the Summit Supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Using more than 27,000 NVIDIA GPUs over the course of one week produced a massive amount of data, 150 terabytes worth in 4,000 time steps. The volumetric data contains about 1 billion points, each of which has seven scalar attributes, such as density, vorticity, and pressure. These attributes are assigned color values that you see on the shock front. 
This data is being visualized using four NVIDIA DGX2 machines, which allows engineers to visualize this large data set and truly see how retro propulsion interacts with the Martian atmosphere. NVIDIA GPUs are doing a lot of work to render what you are looking at, but moving that much data around is just as critical to making this visualization possible. Okay, yeah, so we can see that it's like we generate lots, like huge amounts of data, like 150 terabytes just from one simulation, and it's like really crucial to sort of uh, make this real time uh, visualization. Uh, so just a quick look on what all CFD packages are out there. And um, yeah, I'm sure like most of you might be already aware of all these. For example, ANSYS is the most popular like commercial package and open form comms all star CCM are like other packages. And, and for grid generation, like if we have Gmesh point wise, uh, I think point wise is the commercial and Gmesh is uh, open source. And for visualization, we have Paraview, Visit and Blender. Um, so let's get into the technical part of this talk. Uh, so yeah, why is why is CFD expensive? Uh, uh, so to understand this, we need to we can sort of look at this uh, uh, wing of an aircraft or an airfoil here uh, on the right side. So what happens is like we have uh, a smooth flow which we call as laminar flow initially, but this flow breaks down because the system is unstable and it and it transitions into a turbulent flow um, uh, at some point somewhere uh, in the uh, somewhere midway or like uh, depends on the speed of the aircraft but once this happens like we have these small scale uh, structures here um, on the wing which is like we, we uh, like eddies uh, which you can call eddies or vortex um, so you need to sort of have grid points that are small enough to capture these uh, um, smallest length scales or eddies in the flow and as you refine the grid, you also need to uh, decrease the time step size. So for example, if you want to simulate for five seconds, and if you reduce the time step size, you need to take more time steps. So the cost also increases with the time step size and also space grid size. So the cost scales as n times four, n power four over three, where n is the number of grid points uh, in the domain. So, so yeah, um, so we call this turbulent flow when, uh, and like, the smallest length scale uh, is is uh, was given by Kolmogorov was uh, like sort of uh, developed by Kolmogorov and like in 1950s, and that uh, that scale sort of determines what are like it, it's just a uh, it's an order of magnitude estimate for this scale uh, the the smallest eddies that you can see in the flow, and using this scale you can sort of predict uh, what is the number of grid points you can estimate the number of grid points that you need to simulate for example whole aircraft if you want. Um, and you can sort of express this number of grid points in terms of this Reynolds number, which is the Reynolds number for 2.5. Reynolds number is like a non-dimensional parameter used uh, in, in fluid dynamics. Uh, it's sort of a ratio of inertial uh, um, inertial terms to the viscous terms. Uh, but I think in layman's term, it's like higher the Reynolds number, like faster is the aircraft, higher is the Reynolds number. It's basically how fast the aircraft or the air is going around the aircraft. And also higher the Reynolds number, smaller are the eddies in this uh, in the turbulence flow. So you can sort of imagine like higher the Reynolds number, you need higher number of grid points. So typical values for uh, for an aircraft, this is for Boeing triple uh, seven, just picked. Uh, it's on the order of ten power five, and people have estimated that it's the number of grid points is like ten power sixteen to ten power eighteen, uh, uh, is what you need for the full simulation and. What we call this, uh, I mean, this approach of sort of resolving everything and capturing the small scale, we call it direct num numerical simulation, as the name suggests, and or DNS. Um, and if you want to use this summit supercomputer that we just saw in the previous slide, it's one of the top supercomputers in the world. Um, it requires 20 billion years, which is to, to simulate a whole aircraft, uh, which is not practical, of course. Um, so yeah, here you have um, an image of direct numerical simulation of just an aircraft wing here. Um, yeah, at low Reynolds number in this case. Yeah, it's not a uh, realistic Reynolds number. Um, so yeah, so what are the options? Like people are not just waiting and uh, waiting for the computers to evolve. Um, 
so that you can simulate DNS. So turbulence modeling uh, is the is one is one way to go. Uh, and what uh, turbulence modeling is all about is you sort of, for example, there are like two uh, most popular approaches: the Rance method. What Rance method does is that you time average the Navier-Stokes equations and solve only for the mean quantities. Uh, you can sort of see the picture here on the right, Rance. And when you time average this, you have new terms that you, I mean, new terms appear in the equation because you have averaged the equations. And these, you need to you need to model these terms and close them. Uh, and uh, similarly for LES, instead of time averaging it here, you sort of uh, spatially filter the Navier-Stokes and solve only for the large scales or large eddies that are that can be resolved on the on the grid. And here again, you'll have new terms, and it requires additional modeling. And uh, yeah, these two um, rants is like very uh, cheap and it's uh, used uh, like pretty uh, commonly these days uh, in industries. And but you can sort of see the difference in the fidelity that you can get with these three methods: rants, LES, and DNS is like full solution, full numerical direct numerical simulation. Um, so what about close to the wall? Like wall is like the most important. Uh, uh, region in the domain. So if you can zoom, if we zoom in close to the wall here on the aircraft, or for example on the surface of this Formula E car that we have on the right, uh, we can see uh, this is this is just a zoomed in image of the flow. Uh, yeah, you can see that it's not very obvious in the image, but trust me, like what you have is like uh, these large scale. Uh, you have large scale eddies and small scale eddies, but as you go close to the wall. Uh, the size of the eddies like decrease, and to capture this, um, even though you sort you're sort of using large eddy simulation like LES, which captures only large scales, you need to capture this uh, small scales as you go close to the wall, and you you have to use this grid that you that we that uh, that's there on the uh, side like it has a schematic like it's shown right. Uh, so this again is like. Uh, increases the cost, even though it's it's an LES and not a DNS. Um, so let's see how much, uh, by how much. So for example, yeah, it's the same schematic here. So if we want to, so what we call this is like wall result uh, LES, large eddy simulation, because we are sort of resolving close to the wall. And if, and that is W, that's here in the table. Um, and the DNS, as we saw previously, it scales as a Reynolds number power 2.5, and the grid point for full aircraft simulation was 10 power 16 to 18. But for wall result LES, uh, we can estimate that it reduces to 10 power 11 to 10 power 13, and it can be routinely used by 2050. That's what people uh, predict. And wall model LES is is an alternate approach, so where you sort of don't resolve this anymore, and you add additional modeling. Uh, for the lack of this uh, physics that you're missing by um, by not resolving this small scale at small scales at the wall. But the cost reduction is like our Reynolds number to the power one and the grid point is 10 million to 100 million. Uh, um, yeah, so yeah, and the routine use is like in 2020s. Uh, so this is yeah, this is is an active area of research here uh, here in in our group here at Stanford. Um, so it's not just like you throw in some grid points and brute force uh, use a brute force way of uh, um, uh, to capture all the scales. Uh, it's also important to uh, have like good numerical schemes and models. Here I'm just showing an example of uh, what a good numerical scheme is. So this is just a Sandia flame, D flame. It's a popular uh, test case. Uh, here visualizing we are visualizing temperature field. Uh, on the left is uh, a CFD package called Converse, and on the right is Cascade Technology, another uh, CFD solver uh, company. Um, so here we can see that if we use 0.5 million grids, uh, uh, we almost get nothing. Uh, we, and like so, here we have we have a cross section plot of the temperature, and the dots are from the experiments. Experiments are always considered like the ground or like the absolute truth. Um, for example, for CFD. Um, so you can see that you had to go to 50 million grid points to actually get something that matches with the experiment. But a good numerical with a good numerical scheme, you can sort of get uh, the same result on a 0.4 million here. Like you, 
here you are simulating the same thing, but uh, all the results, all uh, results from all these uh, different uh, mesh resolutions match the experiment. So that's uh, that's uh, that's impressive. So it's, it's important uh, to keep in mind that um, to have we need a good numerical scheme and model. Um, so it's not uh, so CFD is not about like fluid mechanics and is not all about like turbulence or aerospace applications. So multi-phase flows is one of the emerging fields. Uh, and like if you look uh, anywhere, multi-phase flows is sort of like uh, it's natural. It's the natural uh, thing uh, that you can see. It's like when you have two different fluids in, in the domain, say gas and liquid. And bubbles is like when you have lighter fluid inside and a dense fluid outside, like air bubbles in water. And droplets are like water droplets suspended in air. Um, yeah, so it's. So some of the applications are like liquid atomization. Um, here, uh, here you have like a swirling injector. This is again a gas turbine uh, um, a fuel injection in the gas turbine. Uh, you need to optimize this uh, for a better fuel efficiency and also emissions. And and, and uh, a recent application is like, for example, virus spread during uh, sneezing. It's very relevant for COVID these days. Um, so when someone sneezes, you have these a dense turbulent gas cloud that is formed. So it's basically a turbulent glass cloud of uh, uh, mucus and also saliva particles, and the virus spreads uh, through that. So you can sort of uh, do uh, CFD simulation of this and see how far it goes. And um, like, for example, large droplets, because they're heavy, they fall down uh, much faster. And the fine droplets, they persist in the air for long, therefore spreading the infection. Um, um, much more. Uh, and yeah, that's sort of this is sort of the development of numerical methods is is my PhD uh, for multi-phase turbulent flows is the focus of my PhD here. Um, yeah, it's more challenging than single phase turbulent flows uh, because there are there's no absolute minimum length scale uh, in multi-phase flows. Um, so yeah, whenever a drop breaks, you can have like a, a very tiny drop that forms in the middle when when two uh, when when uh, a large drop breaks, so there's no minimum length scale here. It can be as small as up. It can be uh, up to a molecular level. It can go up to molecular level. So that's that's the difficulty here. And yeah, these are some of uh, the famous approaches or like popular methods to model the interface between two fluids. So you have like a, it's just gray and white You're representing two fluids by gray and white. Friend tracking method is like you add particles on the interface and you uh, advect transport these particles. Um, and that's how you sort of keep track of where the interface is. Volume of fluid is like you determine how much within each grid point, how much amount of fluid is present. For example, there's 90% of this gray fluid here, 70% here and 0% of the gray fluid. That's how you track and you sort of solve, uh, solve this and transport this fluid. And level set method is, uh, it's, it's also you know, sort of popular in computer science applications for image processing and other things. But here you sort of construct a, a higher dimensional surface, uh, which takes a value that is less than zero here, and so greater than zero and zero on the interface, and you track this. Um, so these, if you actually resolve this on the grid, something like this, we call this direct numerical simulation for multi-phase flow. Uh, but you can you can imagine that this quickly gets very complex or like very expensive because say you have uh, a chemical reactor here, like it's just uh, a schematic of that on the right side. There are like thousands of droplets. And if you zoom in into this small region here, you can see there are like hundreds of droplets here already. And if you want to resolve, and it's, it's like a thumb rule that if you want to capture the correct properties of a bubble or a drop, you need around 20 grid points around the droplet size. So you can already think, you can already imagine that there will be like thousands of uh, grid points in each direction here, even for the smallest part of this reactor. So now, if you want to solve this whole thing, it's it's kind of impossible. So what you what people typically do is remove this uh, whole drop and add a point particle, and because you are not resolving it, you sort of need to model that and for the missing physics. Um, uh, so that's another. Uh, it's called part point particle model. So here, um, here I'm just showing um, some state-of-the-art simulations of these multi-phase flows. 
So that we actually sort of uh, simulated. Um, okay, you actually don't need audio for this. So this is just a breaking wave in the ocean. Um, so okay, this is laptop the connected wires. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a simulation of a breaking wave uh, in the ocean. Uh, this is important for, uh, for example, if you are interested in studying uh, how much of gas gets dissolved into the uh, ocean. That's important because we want to track how much of CO2 gets transferred and that uh, reduces uh, the, the greenhouse uh, effect or like the climate change. It's important for climate change, basically. So yeah, so as you can see uh, here in the simulation, these bubbles, some bubbles, rise uh, onto the top, but some of them dissolve before rising. So that, yeah, it, when that happens, that's when like carbon dioxide uh, goes into the water or like into the ocean um, from the atmosphere. Here on the right is um, a, a simulation of a jet in cross flow, like you have a fuel jet injection uh, from the bottom to the, like from uh, vertically up and you have a high speed gas flow coming in from the right to left and you can sort of see the complex complexity of the simulation and and the the fine structures that uh, that are that develop that gets developed here um, so we used an adaptive mesh for this simulation but if we had used a uniform mesh uh, with the smallest size that we had, that would that would have resulted in eight billion grid points for this one, uh, which is uh, really expensive. Um, but I can uh, sort of fast forward this a little bit. Yeah. So here, it's also important to do this visualization uh, because it's you know, so we can sort of uh, do. Uh, we can go uh, and look at uh, what exactly is happening and understand the physics behind this. Uh, that's uh, yeah, okay. So this last uh, okay. So this in this one uh, here, I'm just showing three different uh, simulations uh, next to each other of uh, of the differences between bubbles, droplets, and emulsions. Emulsion is like when you have same density fluid uh, both in the carrier phase and the dispersed phase. Here, this is like a lighter uh, fluid uh, suspended in the he uh, heavier one, and droplets are like water, uh, heavier fluid suspended in air. But we can see that when you start off with the same configuration and if you have a turbulent flow, the these particles uh, behave very differently. Uh, so you can see the differences between these three. Okay, yeah, so uh, before transitioning into uh, like the uh, quantum computing part of it, uh, so I want to show like quickly some other large scale simulations that are out there. And these are like the milestones in CFD. Uh, this on the left is like supersonic noise uh, by, uh, uh, this was done at Stanford. This was the first uh, 1 million CPU uh, uh, core simulation uh, and they had 4.1, they used 4.1 trillion um, con uh, control volumes and they use 1.5 million uh, CPUs for this one. And on the right here is like the 2013 Gordon Bell Prize uh, simulation. This was uh, from ETH, uh, LLNL and TU Munich. They simulated 15,000 bubbles collapsing close to a wall and forming shock uh, when they collapse. So they use 13 trillion control volumes and 1.6 million, uh, sorry, 1.6 million uh, CPUs um, and 11 petaflops. So you can sort of see that it's already one whole supercomputer just for one simulation. So just a small video showing the collapse. So yeah, so if we look at these, uh, uh, so top 500 list is like, uh, is like a list of top uh, 500 supercomputers in the world that, uh, the, that they publish every once in six months. This is the latest. Uh, uh, this was published in June 2020. Uh, we can see that the, the first computer is like, uh, uh, it's called Fugaku. Uh, it's in Japan. And it uses 415 petaflops uh, 
sorry, it uses 28 megawatt of power and and it can do 415 petaflops uh, uh, of uh, computation. And and this, if we sort of try to uh, compare uh, what this 28 megawatt is, it's like one, it's equivalent to power consumption of 1.2 million people in India, uh, according to 2016 statistics. So it's it's really expensive. Um, so yeah, but I think. Um, yeah, that's just uh, to know, uh, just to have in mind, like how expensive these computers are. And yeah, so these are like, we can see in the top five, there are like two in United States, one in Japan and two in China, but India is sort of yet to catch up in this uh, sort of global race of uh, what you call like supercomputers. And it's in 66th position right now, the first computer in, the, in India. Uh, and on the, uh, on the right is the same plot of this top 500 list, but over the years from 1995 to 2020, uh, the blue dots is the 500 computer on the and its performance on the y axis. Uh, it's the 500, the last computer on the list, so we can see that it's increasing. And the yellow triangle is the first computer on the list, it's increasing. And the green is like the total power of all the computers in the list. Um, one thing we can see is that it's starting to deviate at some point here. It has already deviated uh, around 2015. Uh, it's not going to follow the same trend in the future. And that we can sort of see in this all plot also uh, uh, um, below here, below this. We can see that uh, as transistors get smaller and smaller, uh, sort of the Moore's law is breaking down. Uh, Moore's law is like um, he said that uh, transistors double, the number of transistors double, uh, um, in, in the CPU uh, every 18 months uh, to be precise, I think. And then it's sort of, we don't have the trend anymore, like beyond 2015, it's sort of breaking down already. Um, so yeah, so there's no exascale machine yet. Uh, what we have right now is the top most is like 415 petaflops. Exascale is like when you have 18, 10 per 18 flops. And US uh, DOE and Intel has announced Aurora which is uh, um, uh, to be commissioned by 2021, end of 2021, at the cost of $600 million. Um, uh, and also one important thing is like, all the supercomputers are like moving toward GPU from CPU because it's more uh, cost efficient. Um, and, and yeah, for this, to, for this transition to uh, go from GPU to quantum in the future, we need uh, investment. I think we, we can see that the investment is already increasing uh, in quantum hardware, uh, and but we need critical mass of people um, working on this. That's where I think Boson Kisai comes in here. So we can, um, uh, yeah, so we can see that India allocated sort of $1.12 billion uh, um, dollars, uh, for the next five years, which is equivalent to what US and Europe has uh, um, allocated in their budget. Uh, it's just a news article showing that. So yeah, why 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 do we need quantum computing for CFD? Because of exponential because of the exponential speed up that we can get. Uh, so for example, n qubits can store two power n bits of information. That's that's that seems pretty great. But of course, there are some catches and challenges here. For example, measurement when you do a measurement, sort of bits latch onto or like it uh, collapses onto one of the base states. So it's uh, I/O input output is pretty hard. Um, and some of the challenges are like hardware scale up. Uh, hardware needs to be scaled up uh, still, and we need error correction um, methods, and also sort of we need algorithms for nonlinear PDs. So, and also high level programming languages. Um, so here we can see on the right is like uh, a schematic what we what they call as quantum volume. So this is like a usable uh, amount of uh, usable uh, uh, sort of. Uh, it's just a, a representation to show how much uh, of actual computation can be done. For example, here on the uh, x-axis is like the number of qubits, and on the y-axis is like the error. Uh, so if you have a very high error of 0.01, uh, even if you scale your quantum computer to 500 qubits, so you can sort of see that it's uh, it's not scaling. Like you're not going to get the uh, get the power out of it. Um, but if your error is like 10 power minus 5. Then you can see as you scale up, you can sort of get gain uh, the advantage. So the quantum volume increases. That's what that's um, 
that's what they say. Uh, so yeah, I just want to show some one or two uh, uh, methods that are out there in the literature that that have I mean, uh, and some um, methods and some uh, author, uh, people that have tried uh, solving Navier-Stokes and quantum computers. For example, the first method is by Ray in 2019. What they did was they sort of reformulated Navier-Stokes into an optimization problem. Uh, so I wouldn't call this like a full Navier, uh, like a Navier-Stokes solution on quantum computer because what they did was they sort of uh, they used a reduced form of Navier-Stokes, uh, uh, and that is like laminar plane channel flow. So if you are interested in solving flow inside a channel, which is like a two plates, flat plates, and a, a laminar a smooth flow that uh, that I previously showed inside the channel, it's the Navier. You can sort of reduce this Navier-Stokes into an ODE. And then they converted this ODE into linear system using finite differences and sort of reformulated this as an optimization problem uh, using least squares and solved this on quantum annealer. And again, um, quantum annealer, we, I think most of you, uh, a lot of people might know the quantum annealer is not really a full or like a, um, it's not equivalent to a universal gate quantum computer. Uh, so we here we have on the, I'm just showing a picture on the right. There are, it's the I think one of the latest 5,000 qubit D wave quantum manila. Uh, but I think universal gate, I think the largest machine is probably on the order of 100, 100 qubits. You can see the difference there. Um, and also their simulation was not very accurate. Uh, so I wouldn't say this is probably the way to go in the future for Navy Stokes, but um, just wanted to mention it. So this is another method. Uh, it's called vortex in cell method uh, by these uh, guys. Um, so in this, instead of solving di Navier-Stokes directly, they sort of reformulated that into a vorticity equation and a Poisson equation for velocity. And as we know, Poisson e equation is expensive. They sort of uh, solved the Poisson equation on. Um, so previously I mentioned that uh, we can use spectral methods that is transforming uh, onto a spectral space uh, using Fourier transform. They used quantum. Fourier transform to solve Poisson equation by transforming this onto uh, spectral space and solving it there, and classically solving the vorticity equation. Uh, um, yeah, so it's a hybrid quantum classical approach, and they sort of ended up using 24 qubits uh, and solved 256 cube mesh. Um, and here there are some uh, uh, results of colliding vortex ring that they obtained. Um, yeah, this seem, uh, this 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 method is uh, promising, but it's still a hybrid quantum classical approach. So you're still solving a um, uh, significant part of it on a classical computer, which uh, limits the capability. Um, another method is uh, is is called quantum lattice Boltzmann method. Uh, so here, um, lattice Boltzmann method is like when you have particles uh, on a lattice and they are sort of interacting with each other and uh, you solve a, a reduced form of Boltzmann equation, um, but they did this on uh, using quantum computer, and they came up with a mechanical quantum mechanical model and simulated formation of shock here. There are some results that we can see uh, from them. So if you have a like a smooth profile, because of the nonlinear term that I was showing before, like highlighting why it's like, why it's very complex to model that, we can see that it sort of results in artificial or like. A, um, automatic sharpening or like it results in self sharpening and we'll have these discontinuities on the grid, which is hard to resolve. Um, so yeah, they simulated this problem in 1D uh, using a type two quantum computer. Um, so type two quantum computer is basically just uh, universal quantum uh, com computer, but universal gate based quantum computer, but small uh, number of qubits, say two, three qubits or four qubits. But they are all connected uh, in a, using classic, classical communication channels. So it's basically like a supercomputer where each node is instead of CPU, it's a quantum computer. Um, and yeah, so and another method that I want to mention is like by uh, this uh, cow at all in 2012. So they this method is also a hybrid method where they sort of update these velocities on classical computer and Poisson equation uh, for pressure was like all of offloaded to quantum coprocessor. Uh, so yeah, so basically I think hybrid hybrid approaches are the current state of the art for uh, Navier Stokes uh, on quantum compute on quantum computer. So that's what I want to show. Um, and just um, 
my thoughts on like future pathway and where we should be looking at in the future and how to go about this in the future so it's so we need to come up with creative quantum algorithms to solve nonlinear pdes because you can't solve nonlinear pdes on quantum compute using quantum algorithms so that's one thing and and we also need to look at uh, so for example measurements and in input and output is hard so what we can do is we can only probe into important quantities of interest so you can design a quantum algorithm so that you don't have to sort of extract the whole velocity field out of it but you only look at say lift and drag if, of an airplane because that's the only engineering quantity of interest that most people are uh, looking at even like with the whole big simulation um, from cfd on on classical yes. computers so and the third and most important uh, part is like development of user friendly languages and multi physics packages uh, for widespread use of this uh, so if we have all this so what does future quantum cfd looks like so it's like a last slide just bear with me so it's kind of um, we can estimate the number of qubits um, that we need for large scale simulations so for example i already showed the supersonic jet noise uh, which which used which had 4.1 trillion grid points and we can see uh, that the number of qubits that you need is only on the order of 42 for this one and for the whole uh, for the bubble collapse problem it had 13 trillion uh, grid points and you need 44 qubits approximately and and the the main and most important problem here full aircraft dns which is impossible right right now it's 10 per 18 number of grid points you need you need 60 qubits to solve this uh, problem so we can sort of see the impact of, uh, of quantum computing uh, for cfd in this so yeah so other potential problems that can be solved in the future that are like currently is not like you can't you can't even think of solving for example accurate atmosphere modeling large scale ocean simulations um, yeah, and also like it's not just about solving unsolvable problems. It's also about solving large problems that takes like that take like six months these days. You, you should be able to do it quickly. That's that's another advantage I think quantum computing can give. And finally, wind tunnel free aircraft design. So any CFD researcher would know this would be the dream of CFD researcher. If you if one day if you can design and fly an aircraft without you doing a wind tunnel test, that's that's when you have really truly achieved what you want to do like in CFD. Um, yeah, that's basically what I had like CFD is like widely used. You need large scale computers to do this and it's power hungry, expensive, slow. Quantum computing is the alternative and finally some acknowledgements. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much so for that wonderful talk. Uh, I even for someone who has been practicing and using these big supercomputers that you mentioned about uh, get, getting a perspective on like uh, interesting topic areas as DNS, uh, wall resolved LES, and also um, I would say multi-phase flow, which is a very, very important topic right now. Um, it, it's very good and like very good to know from you, like your perspective on that and as well as your PhD research. Um, and also the the the, the the section that you had on quantum side is very, very interesting. Uh, some of the numbers that you showed on the last slide were very interesting, I would say. Um, let's see if we can really achieve that as a community together. Uh, so thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, really appreciate it, um, your time and effort. So we have uh, questions that are, that have been asked. Um, so let's, let's go ahead and start taking one by one. Um, Hassan, can you help us with the questions, please? Hassan or Rajat, if any of you. Yeah. Um, OK, so I think the first question was, is there a CFD group for mechanical engineers? Uh, that will be more of a question for Jamie, I yeah. think. <laughs> I'm just going through the list okay. <laughs> one by one. OK, the second question, which I think is much more related, it's uh, what are the advantages of finite volume method or finite difference method for particularly flow simulation uh, CFD in uh, particular components? Um, finite volume uh, has, like, as I already mentioned, like you can have arbitrary shaped uh, control volumes. I mean, you can do that with a finite difference method, as in like 
you have structured grid on finite difference method but what people typically do is like you can sort of stretch that and you can transform that grid uh, uh, into arbitrary shape uh, but it's still sort of uh, hard to do that like if you really have like very complex uh, setting so that's sort of the advantage that's sort of the advantage of uh, finite volume method uh, or finite difference gotcha. All right, so the next question we have is will the conventional nastran be replaced with a uh, replaced here if quantum is used uh sorry could you repeat that what is uh, will the conventional abacus nastran uh, be replaced here if quantum computing is used uh, i'm probably not aware of that maybe hmm. So yeah, sorry uh, to uh, apologize, but the Abacus as well as Nastran are more of like structural softwares to solve uh, st uh, structural dynamics. But oh, um, yeah, so I guess sh uh, in terms of that, sure, uh, quantum computing can be used to, uh, you know, eventually with the, as you mentioned, the growth of the quantum computers, uh, the need for quantum computers, it looks like the for structural dynamics as well. That's the way, uh, the route that the structural dynamic community is uh, looking to go towards as well, I think. Hmm. Uh, and the next question we have is, what is the actual difference between structured and unstructured grid? So yeah, good question. So structured, yeah, that's sort of like, uh, as I already mentioned, that's there's a misconception in the community. Like structured is something that looks like it's uh, it's square and, like uh, yeah but that's not the actual difference uh, even a good looking like a squared mesh can be unstructured so the actual difference is like the way you store the data uh, so 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 let me uh, try to explain it the, in a correct way so for example um, uh, for example if you know the locations of all the grid points you can store them in an array and you implicitly know the location if you store them in a array. So you sort of know what are your neighbors are like. If you do one left indexing, you get your left neighbor and uh, right indexing will right index will give you your right neighbor. But that's not possible with unstructured grid. Unstructured grid is like uh, for each grid point, you explicitly store what are your neighbors. Uh, so for example, um, like for an on an unstructured grid, you can have like tens of neighbors like it can be an arbitrary shaped grid you can have tens tens of neighbors and you just uh, store that information for each uh, grid point say you have this neighbor on this location and so and so forth so that's sort of the difference so for example even on a cartesian like square looking grid it's, it can be unstructured if you actually store uh, say your north neighbor is this cell and your south neighbor is this cell so it's sort of that's the difference Great answer. Hello. Okay. Um, I'll be moving on to the next one. So what do you think your thoughts are on how long Sorry before we can fully simulate an aircraft? Uh, so I think people estimate sometime by the end of this century, you should be able to do it with classical computers, if that's what you were asking. Uh, mm -hmm. A DNS is, is a DNS of that, yeah. Um, but which Hello. quantum algorithm uh, should be used in fluid dynamics visualization? What quantum or like what is what is it? Could you repeat the starting part? Uh, which quantum algorithm should be used in fluid dynamics visualization? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, that I'm not so. I need to think about that. Yeah, I'm not really, I don't have the answer on the top of my head for that. Oh, well, yeah, we can also like take some questions like and then uh, if you have to review them later and we can always post answers later for them too. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Another one we have is um, as a beginner, how do you get started in CFD? Uh, okay, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, there are a lot of resources online, like uh, cfdonline.com is like a very good uh, platform. Uh, I would say I personally learned uh, CFD by watching these lectures when I was in uh, undergrad. Uh, the, there's online lectures by 
I think uh, Sir Suman Chakravarti, I watched those lectures and they were really good. That's what I used when I was learning CFD, but yeah, I think CFD online is a very good. I mean, it's a great starting point, I would say. Great. Sir, um, I have a doubt. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I thought I heard someone. Um, okay, Hello? Not... Uh, uh... Yes. Hello, sir, sir. Sir, I have a doubt. Can I go forward? Sure, sure. Uh, okay. uh, yes. Uh, uh, a very good evening, sir. Suha, sir. Uh, my name is Kaim Teja, and I am from Bangalore. Presently pursuing my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. So I'm in my final year. Uh, so I have been doing ex uh, experimentation as well as uh, solving this numerical methods of, of computational fluid dynamics based on finite volume method in C++ also. And as you mentioned uh, regarding Suman Chakrabarti, sir, and uh, one of from um, IIT Kanpur also have uh, seen all the videos, and now we are uh, developing a startup. So, because we don't have the budget of quantum computing, we have started with uh, artificial neural networks. Initially, we are solving problems of CFD using that. So, what will be your suggestion that how we have to take it forward and how we have to come forward? Uh, that like that's probably Abhishek is a good person to talk about kind of yeah, uh, okay um, so we're gonna focus more these questions on um, the presentation related those questions you can send them through and uh, you know we have Abhishek we have our team that you can uh, we can discuss those uh, forward later so we're gonna okay. go with the other questions then but, but thank you for your uh, comments see. and we'll um, you can just send them directly to us and we'll get back to them I okay. can quickly say okay. something uh, so yes sir uh, so yeah, I, I mean, definitely a neural network is like something that I'm seeing these days, like people have started using it like for all uh, applications. So for example, if you don't have quantum computing, I'm sure neural network is probably the future. Uh, that's that's how where that's where the industry is moving in the future. So I think that's a good start. Uh, I, um, yeah. So but I think you should explore all possible options. It's not like everyone should start working on computing or neural networks. So I, I think it's a good thing that yeah. you have started looking at neural networks. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, so our next question is, um, has any um, uh, has any relevant work been done on solving non-linear PDEs using quantum algorithms, or is it an open problem for now? Uh, I have seen um, one or two uh, papers that sort of, uh, tackle that problem, uh, what they do is they use some sort of non-linear, uh, 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 sorry, uh, they use iterative methods like newton raphson type method to solve a non-linear problem. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's not very efficient. Uh, that's what I thought about it. Like I've talked to the people like uh, some time ago, they told me it's not efficient and that's, it's still sort of an open problem. You can, yeah, you can think of it that way. Got it. Uh, just one perspective on that. Sorry, sorry, Hassan. Just one one perspective on that. Actually, there is this professor from uh, University of Maryland, Andrew Childs. Um, he is someone who actually uh, has touched upon uh, for that like topic. But uh, the only constraint I feel is like you need to have a Hermitian matrix uh, in place so that you can tackle those kind of problems. But it would be a good uh, place to look at if you want to explore more on that area. Good. Okay, uh, in the papers, uh, prior, in the prior papers on applications of QC to CFD, did they mention a speed up as compared to classical methods? Uh, they did mention, but their algorithms were not efficient, and the quantum hardware is not, I think, not mature enough to actually see the speed up right as of now. So I think in some of the applications, uh, some of the uh, results that I showed there had uh, a slowdown basically compared to a classical computer. Uh, but I think that shouldn't be like something that is discouraging you right now because as we know, like the hardware is improving over time. Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all developing at the moment too. Um, okay, this is a bit of a long question, so I'm going to go through it a little slowly. Um, could you please elaborate more on the differences among the front tracking method and fluid method and level set method? Could you also explain the point particle model and what is liquid atomization? Uh, 
that's uh, okay. Let me so that I need to go back to the slide. Let's see. Uh, are you guys still seeing my slides? Yes. Yeah, we can still see them. So, so when you have two different fluids in, in the domain, so let me go back to the schematic. Yeah, so you have say gas and liquid here. Um, so like an example air can be air and water and you have, uh, this is like a domain that you're trying to solve and how water moves here. And you have also air moving around it. So if it is air, it's like very light, so it does, probably doesn't affect the water so much. But for example, that's like an extreme situation, but you can have two different fluids, two different properties, like for example, oil and water. They don't mix, but you have an interface between them and uh, that is sharp. Uh, it's almost uh, up to the like molecular level, uh, the, in the interface uh, thickness. So you cannot resolve this thickness of the interface on the grid. Uh, so what you do is you sort of uh, try to model this as a sharp uh, thing on the grid, uh, sharp surface and to track this uh, there are like there are different ways because it's so one thing uh, that is like it's very hard to uh, uh, track any discontinuities or jumps uh, on an oil area grid because you have like these quantities stored at the grid point and when you try to take a differentiation on that or um, yeah so it's like it's very hard how, how do you different how do you represent a jump on a grid so it's like a hard problem uh, for uh, any numerical method. So yeah, these are like an alternate uh, alternate approaches. Um, so in this, you just add particles on the interface and you attract these. Uh, so you have some flow field, underlying flow field, and you can uh, transport these particles with that underlying flow field, and that sort of acts as the interface between the two fluids here, like just represented by gray and white. And in this method, you have, uh, so I think was that the question like the front tracking method and and point particle method was that the one? Yeah, it was the differences among the front tracking fluid method and level set method. And they also wanted to know if you could explain the point particle model as well as liquid atomization. OK, um, so volume of fluid method is uh, instead of uh, adding particles here on the interface, you sort of uh, calculate how much percentage uh, of this uh, cell is filled by one fluid or the other fluid. So for example, if we are looking at the gray fluid, this cell is uh, filled 90% by gray fluid and the uh, 0.7 by this fluid, and it's 0% here by gray fluid, 0% everywhere else here in this point. So you can also solve an additional equation that sort of acts this uh, percentage of uh, present in, in, in each cell. So yeah, if you solve that equation, then you can sort of approximately track where the interface is, <clears throat> interface is on the grid. Um, so that is volume of fluid method and level set method is, uh, yeah, it's a little bit hard to, I think the schematic is not very good here, but uh, what I can say is that you, you construct a higher dimensional field. Um, basically, if you have a 2D uh, grid here, the you construct a field phi, uh, which is three dimensional and that, uh, and that uh, field will take a value something positive in one fluid and negative in one fluid and zero at the interface. So you, that's how you, and then you can sort of transport this. And that's how you can sort of keep track of where the interface is. And once you have all these interfaces, you can sort of, uh, if you go back and look at the Navier-Stokes equation, you have these densities and viscosities there. And each, uh, I mean, previously for a single phase flow, the density is same. You have one fluid and the density of the fluid is same. So you don't have to uh, take into account the densities there. But now you know how much percentage of this cell is filled by one fluid and how much is other fluid. So you can uh, approximate the density. Uh, you can calculate di uh, different densities in each cell. And that's how you sort of uh, get a different uh, two fluids. Uh, and point particle model is like, this is the same. Uh, so when you have like thousands of bubbles, uh, you can't really resolve all of them. Like uh, like the rule of thumb is like, you need, uh, like if this is one bubble here, 
these bubbles are like sort of a light fluid in so they are like rising up in this column so for, for you to resolve this uh, shape and the correct forces that are acting on the bubble um, you need like 30 uh, around 30 grid points 20 to 30 grid uh, cell grid points across the whole diameter of the bubble so that is like really expensive you can see you can calculate like you can probably estimate that you need you probably need 1 billion grid points just to simulate this or at least on the order of hundreds of millions to simulate this uh, structure here small structure but which is actually a small part of this whole reactor chemical reactor so if you need to simulate this whole thing where there are like like 10000 of particles i think uh, you cannot do them uh, you cannot fully capture the interface so what you do is you replace this with points like which are like infinitely small they are just lagrangian points on the on the grid and you add uh, and you keep track of those points and add additional uh, physics modeling like for example drag force lift force and uh, because you're not really capturing that uh, directly you need to add that uh, uh, yeah that's yeah that's basically point particle method and you can reduce the grid size so you can have one you you can have one grid point for one whole bubble and then yeah that's that should be um, that should reduce uh, uh, that should significantly reduce the grid size yeah Got it. Awesome. Okay, we'll just take in about three to four more questions. Uh, we are getting a lot of them, so if we do miss any, uh, we apologize on our behalf for that. Um, okay, so the next question we're going to be taking is, is CFD the same as aerothermal analysis? Uh, see if aerothermal analysis is the field, uh, like is the physics part of it. CFD is like you're solving it, the process of solving. Um, it's like computational fluid dynamics is like you're trying to solve uh, the fluid equations to study, say, uh, aerodynamics or like to do thermal analysis. Um, yeah, that's how I would differentiate between CFD and aerothermal analysis. Yeah. So uh, one other question came in. Why do we have so many methods like FDM, FVM, FEM for simulation when just method one method is enough for one problem? Because at the end, we do end up doing validation and verification. Uh, <laughs> what, what do you mean by uh, one method is like good for one problem? As in, uh, I mean, like, like finite element methods, you know, sometimes like it's, there's, there's like one method that's, you know, it can be universally applicable to most problems. So asking why do we have so many different types of methods being used? Yeah, uh, that's like a million dollar question. I think it's like it's it's present in every field. Like you, you like if someone comes up with a method and they claim that it's good for one particular application. I mean, there are people that are always like, OK, we, we have another method that's good for a different application, right. better than yours. Uh, for this, I mean, for example, finite element is good for solid mechanics. Um, finite uh, volume methods are good for fluid stuff. Uh, so. Yeah, I think it's a lot like coding too, right? You have like Python, C++, you have so many different languages. In the end, they just code stuff and present you an application, whereas all of them mostly do it. But it's just the different ways they do it and different yeah. comfortability levels of people. And it also depends on exactly what you're looking down for. So down like some on the external outlook side, they look similar that they do the same thing but when you deep dive inside there's specific applications and things that they focus on that maybe other ones don't that you need out all right so uh the next one we'll be taking in is um as a fellow researcher in cfd resources what are resources available for implementing simple cfd algorithms on quantum computing like say solve the burgers equation uh as shown in the reference paper I don't think there is any platform, but I, I know there are some simple, like uh, the qubit, like IBM. I think has. Uh, I think we. I think maybe uh, probably others are probably more aware of this. I think IBM has like free quantum computing. I think maybe five qubits. I'm not sure uh, which people can mm -hmm. use, but it's still like it's in the gate level. You need to construct the gate and other things. Uh, I yeah. So I'm not aware of any higher level programming languages or platform that are out there that you can use off the shop off the shelf and try to write programs for CFD. Hi, uh, excuse me. One last question. Uh, this was, uh, 
Sorry, can you hear me? Um, yes, who's this? Uh... <laughs> yeah, this was my question, which, which you just asked. Okay. This was my question about the resources for CFT. Uh, sorry, I'm Hello. not a Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, the question which you just took, uh, I asked the question about the resources available for quantum computing to make simple CFT algorithms. So I'm a researcher working at Oklahoma State University. I worked on discontinuous algorithm methods and CFT for a while. Now we are doing some wind predictions for UAV, wind gust predictions for UAV, and we're just exploring neural networks and quantum computing. So I was wondering, you showed us some reference papers where they used to solve like Burgess equation and uh, other stuff. So I was wondering, what are the resources available? I saw the IBM uh, qubit. Actually, our previous university had a tie up with IBM. The NC State University has an IBM Innovation Center for Quantum Computing. So, but it has very basic, uh, as you said, just the logic gates and qubit gates. So I was wondering what would be the resources. I did see there was a QIS kit on Python uh, for solving some simple linear algorithm, linear equation algorithms. So, so I was just wondering what do you, do you use or what do the leading edge researchers use right now to, as I said, simple, just solve a wave equation, say. Uh, so, so if I, I yeah, so, I think sorry. Like Abhishek can go back. Yeah. Yeah, so um, thanks for that question. Um, actually, that is the difficult part. Like it's not really like classical computer where you where you can make like simple codes uh, for CFD um, and implement that. That is the challenging part, which uh, we at Boson QSI are trying to solve. Uh, basically taking those equations and actually trying to build the infrastructure um, or algorithms, I would say, uh, to implement in quantum uh, quantum computers. So it, it's not very uh, it's not in that stage. Uh, that we can we can have those use cases um, available to us and just like got it up. But yes, as you mentioned, Quizkit is one of the uh, programs. Uh, then there is QHash. Um, there's Penny Lane, which is I think so more for annealer side. I think so River Lane and Penny Lane. So these are some of the resources uh, that are available. Um, there is very uh, less number of open source. Uh, platforms that are available, but yes, with Quizkit and other quantum simulators, you can uh, try and start like cracking that part. Uh, that's that's the best I think. So we we have um, for currently for the quantum computers. Thank you so if, much. Yeah, so as if you would like to add anything on that. Um, I think there are also a good way to start is to also use emulators if you don't have the hardware, uh, I mean, uh, available to you right away. There are, I think, some emulators. I don't have the names, maybe Abhishek might know, but you can start off with that and try to write algorithms and see if they work. Once you are ready, you can sort of uh, use that on hardware. Yeah. Thank you so much, that was helpful, thank you. All right, okay, so we'll be taking our last question for the session right now. Um, okay, so can we use Quantum computing for computing latent heat and other specific entities like enthalpy and thermal systems. Um, so, what do you mean compute latent heat and other specific entities? Like, um, I mean they're they're part of the solution. I mean, if you have, if you're solving uh, Navier-Stokes equation and say if it is uh, if you're trying to do a conjugate heat transfer problem, then uh, you can solve an additional temperature equation, or if you're doing, say, compressible uh, simulations, then you solve an additional equation for energy, which sort of uh, keeps track of this uh, enthalpy and temperature and internal energy and other things. And you can sort of. Uh, so I don't understand what you, what the question. Uh, so I what, think I think the person who asked this was Abdullah Kazi. If you want to elaborate on your question, you can take the floor. Give it about five, ten seconds. If not, we can just pass it through. Uh, I'm not sure. Hey, Tim, are you able to hear? Um, yes. Is this Abdullah Kazi? Uh, 
yeah just a small query like uh, uh, th that's fine like from the physics point of view all these details are fine but from quantum computing point of view just want to know like uh, uh, from all of these uh, physics variables like which variable we should uh, map to the qubits uh, where we need all those uh, quantum properties like uh, entanglement and superpositions and all so that's still i think uh, it's left to the people that develop the algorithms, right? I mean, there are a lot of options you can use. I think as I showed, I think in number of, I think in a couple of examples that I showed, people used velocity, people used vorticity to map. You can solve Poisson pressure uh, for Poisson, uh, Poisson equation for pressure. So it's up to you what you want to map uh, and you can choose. I mean, you can uh, choose different uh, uh, uh yeah, you can choose uh, different variables uh, to store on quantum, but ideal way, ideal thing to do is to like have everything on quantum and not to hybrid classical quantum, but let's see when we can achieve that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, okay. So those are the questions we're gonna be taking for now. Um, thank you so much for like uh, taking those in and answering them. Uh, we do apologize in the case we did miss a few. Uh, there were just so many coming through. Um, yeah, so if and if people can uh, pass those questions, uh, we can we can try to answer those um, in subsequent uh, because I, uh, we are overboard with the time and we don't want to take uh, more more time also as he, he has he has important things to get get to now. Uh, so I would again, um, on behalf of uh, Boson QSI um, and QCI as well as ISCFD, I would like to thank Suhas for your uh, amazing talk. Thank you for giving so much time uh, for even answering the questions very patiently. And thank you everyone in the call um, who have uh, came together today to hear uh, Suhas uh, giving his insight on a very interesting area that uh, we are interested in as a community uh, itself. So let's see, let's hope. Uh, we make good progress um, just to let everybody know for the next talk, which will be on 15th. Um, we are hosting a very uh, well renowned professor from uh, Missouri s and um, Dr. Joseph Smith, um, and uh, you will find more information on the website of Boson QSI. Um, and uh, if, if there's anything else that uh, Sam or Jamie, uh, if they're here still can uh, like if they want to say anything. Uh, I'm fine just to say thank you to for everyone for tuning in today and we look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm not sure if Sam is still in the call. Maybe. OK, so um, Thank you everyone again. Uh, thank you for joining in. Thank you Sohas again for this amazing talk um, and we hope to achieve some great things out of this uh, talk. Thank you one and all. Thanks. Bye bye.